All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, we're going to have a really fun discussion today about creativity uh, and the education process. Uh, I'm Warren Wakeman. I'm going to be the moderator today. Um, why don't we just do a, a quick round of introductions and say who you are and where you're from, and then we'll get into it. Um, why don't we start with you, Michael? Hi, I'm Michael Hernandez. I teach high school journalism, film production, and broadcast journalism. Uh, and photography in the Los Angeles area. Great. Jessica? I'm Jessica Herring Watson. I'm a clinical instructor in the College of Education at the University of Central Arkansas. Great. And Julie? Hello, my name is Julie Garcia, and I'm a former math and science teacher at the middle school level, and I'm currently serving as the program manager for instructional technology in the San Diego Unified School District. Awesome. Well, this is going to be a lot of fun. We've uh, we've all come together today to talk a little bit about kind of the changes in education because of these recent challenges uh, from the pandemic to everything else that's going on in the world for the past few months and how that's created some some new opportunities as well as challenges for us as as educators. Um, it's it's really interesting. I think that as we kind of talk about this this role of creativity, we've all defined creativity a little bit differently. Differently. Um, no longer really have we referred to it as a sort of creativity leading to a certain product. Uh, but in, in talking to the three of you previously, you, you've all sort of expressed this perception of creativity as a process or as a new mindset. So I thought it would be interesting to, as we're talking about creativity, helping us define these terms a little bit better and, and maybe expanding on that a little bit more about creativity as a process, as a mindset, as sort of a, a destination instead of a, an, an end game. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think typically the default is to think of creativity as art. Uh, but you think about our world right now and everyone's talking about looking for creative solutions. Right, no matter what it is, it's your business, and you're looking for a creative solution because your customers can't come in anymore. You're a teacher who's like, I've lectured and given paper handouts all my life, and now I need a creative solution to teach my students. You know, the parents are like, I need a creative solution to deal with my kids while I'm trying to zoom and get work done while they're in the background. So I think it's really like this ongoing mindset of like, how do we manage change? How are we able to pivot? How are we able to be flexible? Um, and all of the pieces that go along with that. So like inspiration and, um, you know, iteration and uh, revision and looking for uh, collaboration from other people in other places. And so for me, that's kind of what it meant, what it means to me. And that ultimately becomes like a lifelong learning skill, uh, no matter what your subject area, because, you know, science keeps changing, you know, social studies, history keeps being written. Um, things are the facts are going to change, um, but what's not going to change is the human piece of that, which is how to manage all of that information um, and how to be productive with it. I can jump in next. Um, I I recall being um, you know starting to like explore my creativity and um, making comments to my colleagues about I'm just not creative, right? I'm a math teacher. How do how how do I be creative in solving an equation? And somebody really called to my attention. They go, "Well, Julie, your creativity comes out in other ways. Like, how are you designing lessons for your students? How are you engaging them in a con in the content in a meaningful way?" And so when you look at the word creativity um that it's create right and and as we teach our students we don't want to be the person that disseminates the math knowledge the science knowledge the content knowledge we want students to create that themselves so we as teachers or district leaders we need to help teachers facilitate that creation of their own understanding of content um, because that's what engages them. And I think we've seen a bit of that with the distance learning, as Michael was discussing, right? How do, how do we motivate students? We allow them to create and, and to make their own meaning. And the same thing has to happen with the teachers in our district. So I think I agree with Michael as well that creativity is also finding creative solutions to everyday problems. What's going on and how do we do that? Anywhere from getting our kids to pick their clothes up around the house to being a teacher and getting our students engaged in the learning. So um, I think creativity is definitely a mindset. 
to play off of what both of you said, I think I really have creativity has really become encapsulated for me in this season around the idea of reimagining all of the spaces that we're working in. Um, we've had to do that as instructional designers, reimagining what school looks like when it isn't around a physical space. Um, our students have had to reimagine what learning looks like when they maybe have very limited resources with which to learn. That was something that we really had to navigate. At, I mean, all of us, whether we're in the K-12 space or the higher ed space, how does learning get reimagined when I can only learn with my smartphone and I don't have access to other devices or maybe to all the things that I'm used to having when I'm in this physical space of school. So I think while reimagining school has created many challenges and barriers that we've had to confront, it's also created these really incredible opportunities for us to, um, I'm trying to think of the right word, just be completely creative, throw what we were doing before kind of to the side and say, okay, when everything we thought was true and real about school is off the table, what can it look like moving forward? I think that is the ultimate creative challenge. I love the idea of reimagining things. I think that's really great because you constantly have to evolve no matter what you do, right? And uh, all those, the successful folks are the ones that are able to reimagine what we've done in the past. I love that. So then, so thinking about that, taking that that idea from Jessica, where do you look for that that inspiration, right? I mean, it's sometimes it just happens, right? When you're not planning for it, but then other times, where do you go to to get these kind of crazy ideas that you're going to implement and, and try the next day? So I like reaching out. I, I have a very strong uh, group of teachers that I work with in our district. Uh, we have a strong, um, we have our innovative teaching network, uh, teachers that come together to share inspirational ideas, to share lessons. So when a lot of this, uh, when we went to distance learning, a lot of us reached out to those professional learning networks and, and really, um, you know, started sharing ideas. Like our district, we we started preparing materials for a possible closure of schools. And a lot of that was uh, from my ADE friends that we were um, sharing ideas. Oh, we're starting to curate a list of resources to send home. Um, so really tapping into those professional learning networks, uh, social media, such as Twitter, um, but then those close companions at, at, at the school sites that are really pushing to try to do things different. We um, tapped into a lot of their ideas and brainstormed and um, really using teamwork and colleagues to uh, push us into those next steps. It was really important for us. Yeah, I would agree with Julie. I think having a really broad professional learning network um, of people in lots of different teaching spaces, because I think often with our close networks, we work with these trusted collaborators that push us and challenge us to be better, but we're also in the same thinking space. So sometimes that can lead to this convergence or this group think around, well, this is the right direction to go. So I really think having that broad PLN to see all of the different ways that people have reimagined school all over the world has been um, really important to challenging my thinking and encouraging me to try new things. Yeah, I agree with both of you guys. Um, social media used well is super effective. Like I think my best professional development is on Twitter. Um, and it's some colleagues that I have in other places in the world. Um, I definitely agree, Jessica. Like I'm actually the only person at my school that teaches what I do uh, in the entire district. So I don't have colleagues on site, so I need to reach out globally. Um, but also I look for um, resources and inspiration outside of education. So, um, for example, just this morning, I was reading an article from Forbes and it was talking about, you know, machine learning and AI and like moving away, pivoting away from uh, memorizing facts to, you know, managing learning as like, what do we do with those facts and how do we, um, how do we create, how do we make things? And so, uh, you know, I follow Harvard Business Review and Forbes and Fast Company and all of these things that it's not that school should be a business, but there's a lot of interesting um, insights about innovation, about collaboration, about teams, um, and about creativity. Um, 
so it's really important, I think, to, to build that network beyond just education and beyond your subject matter as well. I mean, that's a great point, Michael. I think that, you know, we all kind of represent different areas, too, as far as where our kind of our educational home lives. You know, I'm in uh, kind of postgraduate education for health professions. But it what your comment just reminded me of, you know, I've been looking at my son's fourth grade class for inspiration of things we're going to do with our medical students, you know, utilizing Flipgrid or Flipgrid like uh, services for uh, kind of an onboarding exercise that we're going to do. Uh, and if I had told, you know, my my medical education colleagues that, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to leverage what they're doing in my son's fourth grade class. Initially, they might think, well, that's kind of crazy that you're going to do that. But <laughs> I think it's it's important to to think about that spectrum, right, because I think we're all very good at what we're doing it just as you said sort of that that group think of you know this is perfect for medical education but there's a lot of things that are really great in other areas of education or even outside of education as michael as you said so then as as individuals right so i think we've we've talked a little bit about where we as individuals go for inspiration uh, we have the professional learning networks how do you kind of work with your colleagues when it comes down to sort of the, the daily effort? You know, how do you inspire your colleagues or even how do you inspire your students? Let's start with the students first. How do you inspire them to, to kind of tackle this change? Because as, as difficult as it is for us, I can only imagine as a, as a learner, as a student, this is a pretty challenging time as well. So how do you connect now in this sort of new environment with your students? I can start that one. Um, I just think for teachers in this season, really in every season, but it's become, it's become even more important now that we start by building a foundation of trust with our students in the classroom. That cognitive work, that creative work cannot take place if our students don't feel that they can trust us with their ideas um, and trust us with the learning process because learning is scary. There are mistakes along the way. There are opportunities for failure. And so if we don't cultivate a safe, trusting community um, for collaboration and for learning, then I don't think we can get to those higher cognitive levels we want our students to go to for really powerful creation to happen. Um, so we've been using tools like Flipgrid to build discussion into the class, just so we can get to know each other. Having spaces that are not discussion spaces related to the content where you can just share what's going on with you, what are things that you are loving and learning in your own personal time outside of our class, um, or what are hard things that you're struggling with and how is how can we come around you and support you in that. So I really think trust and safety is foundational to any kind of creativity that we want to cultivate, especially in the season that we're in right now. I totally agree with that, Jessica. Um, safety is, is super important for creativity. Um, and then I think like we started to talk about this a minute ago, but um, modeling the behavior and the process that you want to see in your students. So what's been really great about remote learning is that <laughs> our process is laid bare in front of all the students, all the mistakes that we make, <laughs> learning to yep. use Zoom or, you know, how am I getting the assignments in the right form at the right time to everybody and sort of acknowledging and like, hey, look, I make mistakes too. And we're, le we're learning together and being very clear about that. And I think traditionally it's been a very hierarchical, top down kind of uh, situation where the teacher knows everything and you better fall in line and follow the rules. Otherwise you get in trouble. And moving away from that model, which was never really healthy in the first place to one of like, we're learning together. Let's help each other out. Uh, you can see me make mistakes and it's okay. And knowing that it's okay to make a mistake along the way, I think is really important. Um, and then um, I think also um, as far as the inspiration piece that you, you were asking about, um, some of the assignments that I give to my students is to go out and search for something that inspires them. So I'll give them some parameters, um, but like reaching beyond the classroom. So we see the students' examples in the classroom, they see what each other are doing, but just like Jessica was saying, you can have that group thing start to happen and everybody starts to um, repeat what's been done because I think that's the successful model. So uh, definitely having the students engage in social media like Instagram and Twitter to find uh, new folks to follow and accounts to follow and find inspiration and reach out to them um, and then do some reporting around and some research around what they find um, as, and, and doing some um, thinking about what is it that I find inspiring or interesting about this artist or this personality? Um, 
and getting some of that metacognition firing off to uh, inspire their own work, I think is important. So uh, we learned a lot about distance learning in San Diego Unified School District. Um, I, I think there were a lot of assumptions made um, by us and by teachers, uh, first of all, that just students are gonna be okay, right? It's okay, they, they, they use computers, they use phones, they're gonna be fine. And uh, taking a step back, I really wish we would um, have taken more time and we are planning to take that time in the beginning of next school year to really, like Jessica says, establish that trust. Um, but we're also gonna be working on a lot of social emotional learning, getting students to connect with each other online. Um, making those connections because kids are really missing each other. And so they're not going to feel safe to create until they have that community. And that's the community usually built in a face-to-face -face classroom. So for those starting with distance learning, that's going to be a challenge. So we're working on um, quality learning interactions in our district and, and activities and things that teachers can do to engage students. It might be that flip grid. It might be just a Zoom call. It could be a small group, but really... Um, getting kids comfortable with the learning platforms we're expecting them to learn on, um, the communication tools, uh, the expectations for the week, right? Uh, what assignments look like. So ours, our distance learning was a bit of a challenge. Um, we're a very large district, but um, we saw a lot of um, teachers trying to do the same thing that they did in their classrooms. Like, we're going to read this article today, then we're going to do this graphic organizer today. And there were these daily lessons. And it's like, oh, my gosh, the parents were you know, trying to keep up. The kids were trying to keep up. So so we need to be creative in um, what those what the content is we're expecting students to do. Like Michael said, what drives you? What's exciting to you? Right. And that's what's going to engage our students in the learning, especially through distance learning. So as we're looking through teaching concepts like math, are we asking kids to go in and measure with cups and look at fractions in the kitchen? Are we asking students to develop a recycling program with their house and within their own home community? How are they gonna improve their recycling? Like give them these the purposeful content that then engages them. So our district, we have the no harm grading and we kind of saw our students do the, okay, I'm gonna try this for a little bit and yeah, I'm okay with the grade I got. I'm just gonna, you know, I'm done. So I think um, for our district, we wanna be really creative with teachers in the planning, what a week looks like. It's not necessarily a day by day lesson. Um, and what it is we're asking kids to do. Is it meaningful? Is it relevant? Does it connect them to the real world? Is it something they're interested in? And believe me in math, that's sometimes a little bit of a stretch, but you can do it, right? Like you can, you can find a way for them to make it meaningful for them and then give them that creative pathway to share their learning. Is it, is it better, you know, and I, I feel like I'm talking a lot on this one and I apologize, but you know, we're looking at shifting the way that teachers are looking at assessment as well. How do I give a test online? How do, how do I know the kids aren't cheating? How come they're not Googling? And so we, we're trying to shift that, well, maybe you want them doing a task that they can't Google, right? Or, or, or what kind of questions are you asking? And, and that is where it becomes engaging and meaningful for students, whether they're face-to-face, -face, hybrid, or at home all the time. Yeah, that's so, it's exactly what yeah. we're thinking, Julie. It's like, it's made everybody think about what does assessment mean? What does learning mean? What am I asking the kids to do? That's so important. In fact, I was just reading this article about in math, I'll share it with you later, but um, okay. it's like stop calculating yes. uh, and start teaching computational thinking. So yes. we have tools that can do that for us. So let's go to higher level thinking about what we're doing. And like you're saying, you can cheat if you bubble in something, but if you're supposed to create something, you know, an authentic artifact, you can't really cheat. Right. And, and, and they can do that, right? It just yeah. takes time and to the willingness. And I believe, I do believe it's a shift in mindset for teachers. And, you know, in our role right now in the district office, that shift in mindset is challenging enough. And then to do that digitally with teachers, you know, it's, a, it's a challenge all around, but anyway. Yeah, those are, those are great. Um, one thing I, that you mentioned, Juliet, that I, I kind of want to focus on, and whenever I, I talk with either new students or new physicians, I always like hearing a little bit more about 
about the failure part of, of what got them here today. And I know that, you know, no one's been immune to having some, some missteps along the way, especially with everything going on right now and just trying to figure out how we're going to educate. You mentioned a little bit, Julie, some of the challenges that, that you had gone through, but I'm curious, you know, Michael or Jessica, and I'd be more than happy to chime in as well. Um, what, you know, they may not be huge failures, but, but what missteps have you taken um, kind of in this early phase of trying to figure that out? And now as you're starting to think about, you know, this is, this is going to be the new norm for a little bit longer. How are we going to apply that failure to future success? I feel like uh, teachers have a challenging time um, providing creative type types of tasks to students because they don't fully understand what it feels like. Um, I think traditionally we've handed teachers, um, here's your curriculum, here's your textbook, you're to teach to the, teach this, follow this pacing calendar. And so they don't have experience being creative. And so when we did our distance learning, when the first was, oh, we're just gonna go home and give you some enrichment. And then we went and gave them, we packaged curriculum for people that weren't comfortable teaching online. We're like, here's this curriculum. And I feel like we, might have not given them as much of an opportunity to use their creativity in planning their lessons by providing that packaged content. Um, but many teachers liked it. So if I were to look at a failure that we, I, I wouldn't say it's a failure, it's a, an experience to grow from, <laughs> but giving teachers that option of here's something to start with and then, or maybe even choice that they can pick and choose from. So possibly over scaffolding might've been a, uh, an area of need for us. Yeah, I would agree, Julie. I think the lack of professional development around creative lesson plans uh, and technology, uh, which, you know, ironically, a lot of teachers resisted. Um, you know, you see the cell phone pockets in the high school setting where kids are supposed to put their phones <laughs> in the pocket when they come in. Uh, teachers take attendance by that. Um, it's really sort of fascinating um, that they're in denial of what the real world is like. Um, and I think, you know, while you were talking about this, Julie, I think it really reminded me of the key word that I think sort of summarizes all of this situation, which is flexibility. And so it's the ability to be flexible because it's a survival skill, no matter what uh, you're in. Mm -hmm. um, and also um, the flexibility of time. So like you're saying, Julie, instead of having like these rigid structures, whether you're the teacher creating lesson plans, which is, I'm not a robot, I don't want to repeat somebody else's lesson, it doesn't fit my style, um, or it's on a physical, like biological level of like, the bell rings, they tell you when you can eat, when you can go to the bathroom, there's no light, you know, you have to be finished in this amount of time, otherwise you're not smart, um, all of those things. And so what I found is students actually being really successful because they had flexible time um, to do mm. these things. In fact, they found that there was so much um, time that they were able to do, follow their passions and start businesses. <laughs> like you, wait, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, flexibility I think is, is really huge, but uh, again, uh, and I, as you, I hear you talk about this, Julia, and like, this is exactly what we should be doing with our students as well, right? It's the same thing, we're all learning together. And so we're teaching not to be rigid and you gotta fit in this whole um, pigeonhole. And, and, and it really, I think teachers also have lost their passion because there is no creativity in lesson plans. It's already yeah. meted out for you by the department or standardized test companies have decided what you need to teach and for and, and at what depth um, and how much time it's supposed to take. And, and so it's kind of takes the passion out of teachers as well. And when you do that, I think that really uh, reflects in, in your curriculum and in your classroom. Um, but, um, you know, getting back to Warren's question about failing safely, I think you know, failing in, uh, for physicians might mean a different thing than failing in an English <laughs> class in middle school. Uh, <laughs> literally life and death uh, kind of distinctions there. Um, so I think maybe what you mean, Warren, is like the ability to acknowledge when you're wrong or ask for questions and ask for help. I think that's probably the key thing um, before it gets to that point, because you see all this research about cultures where that's not possible, um, where you don't question your superiors um, and you end up, there's these examples of like plane crashes and stuff like that, because the co-pilot didn't question the pilot's, you know, mindset. And so the whole plane went down. And so I think that's a metaphor for education as well. Like if we're going to not question what we've done before, um, then that's going to really be a problem. We're going to crash everyone. So um, I, I would say like in the medical field, I think that's probably a good place to be in is to 
be safe to ask questions and look at that as a strength rather than as a weakness. Um, if you doubt something or you are wondering something, that, that's actually um, a positive characteristic. That actually goes back to Jessica at the beginning when she talked about having people, not just finding those friends that are gonna tell you that everything's great, like those that are in your little community, right? She's like, find those people that are gonna question and poke at you and say, well, what about this? Um, such a great connection, Michael. And I was gonna build on that and say, I think if we teach our students that same critical lens to what they learn, we can learn so much from them. So I think that is something that is could be really powerful moving forward is like Michael was saying earlier, modeling that lifelong learning, saying I am figuring this out alongside you. And part of us being in community together is you being honest with me about what's working for your learning and what's not. But that requires a, a level of trust and understanding but also I think a modeling of what it looks like to be constructively critical, um, showing our students how we are pushing back on ideas, how we're learning when people push back on us and accepting that pushback humbly. Um, that's not a comfortable place if you are a teacher that has been the sage on the stage and you know all the things. Um, so really I think being a facilitator and a designer first, recognizing those elements of our teacher identity um, and getting comfortable with being a, a little uncomfortable, you know, that's where we're going to see the most growth. And I think that's where we will see the most real and lasting change in what school looks like for teachers and for our kids. Yeah, I love that idea, Jessica. And I just think it's like purpose is the key word there. Like, what's the point of doing all this, which the students are actually asking out loud, what's the point of school? Like, what are we here to do? But then in terms of the concept of failure, um, it's really maybe easier to have conversations around mistakes or different directions or different choices that you could make or different questions to ask if you take your ego out of it. So like you said, the teachers have so much ego involved, like our, our reason for living <laughs> is that we're the smartest person in the classroom and everyone's going to do what we tell them to do. And when that isn't happening, like right now, we're sort of at an existential crisis. Like what, what am I here to do? I'm going to be outsourced by a computer or something and yeah you will be so change what you do because the magic happens in this interpersonal kind of piece but um, if we all keep the focus on the purpose what's the purpose of this lesson what's the purpose on math what's the purpose behind you know science why are we learning these things and not so much about me and not so much about you but like okay is this the right direction we want to go with it to get to this end point what's our purpose and i think maybe that's a great way to frame it that makes it a little bit easier and I know nothing about the medical field, so correct me if I'm wrong, which I probably am, but like thinking about how the teams have to collaborate, you know, um, for diagnosis or for treatment, right? You've got a whole team of people that are working on things together. And so if everybody has that shared purpose and we're asking the right questions uh, what, and, and the right metrics, you know, what does it mean to be successful? I think that's like a key uh, piece here too for when we're talking about failure or purpose is like, what are we actually trying to measure? Are we trying to measure time in a seat? Does that equal learning? Are we, are we measuring you with like one test score on one particular day? Um, are we measuring uh, productivity? Um, what are those metrics? And I think that's, those are important questions to ask as well. And that's hard too, because people are, um, our, our, our system kind of, ties us to that. Like you look at AP tests in high school, you look at standardized testing, you look at, um, you know, the six period a day, this many hours, the bell rings at this time. So it, it's a mindset of teachers. It's an organization. Like there, there's so many things that have to shift to get to that, uh, to that point. Right. It's about that culture, right? I mean, it's, you know, there is the, the culture component, you know, within our respective education areas. I mean, medical education and health education has a unique culture, um, as I know that, you know, all of your different schools have that culture as well. But I, and I think it also, you know, as, as you all have mentioned, it really stems down to that professional identity as well, right? What, you know, pre-pandemic, I think there was a different perspective that we all held about our profession. And now with this, you know, this giant disruption, it's really causing us to 
to redefine that. And in some ways that disruption is really good because it allows us to create new opportunities. Um, but for those that don't have that, that kind of more flexible mindset that aren't able to adapt or pivot as easily, it really becomes almost a personal, how do I define myself as an educator now? Because I can't do what I've spent the last X number of years doing. And I thought I was doing quite well. Uh, I mean, that's pervasive, you know, on the medical education side yeah. as well. Yeah. You know, we have, you know, a lot of the, the sages on the stage that have been doing it the same way because it's been effective for them. But now that that's out of the equation, how do you sort of have them pivot? And how do you do that faculty development when the nature of the faculty development involves distance teaching or distance learning for someone who's never done that before? And we see it on our end all the way through the actual practice, right? With things like telemedicine, we have physicians that never had a desire to do telemedicine before. And now that's becoming the mainstay of their practice. So, you know, it's, it's from the education all the way through the practical output side that it's, it's causing all of us to, to pause and think, wow, you know, what is, what is the core part or what is that purpose that we're here for? And the methodology may change, but what is my role in maintaining that purpose? Um, it's a, and it's really challenging. It's 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 yeah. hard, and I think everyone across the board has a fair amount of frustration, right? There's just the, the getting through the day part um, with all the things outside of your professional world that are happening and changing, and then layering this on as as someone who's previously been in a position of having to teach or instruct or, or guide or lead. I think is it's a tough time for everyone, and I think it's important that we also just acknowledge that it's. It's not been an easy time. Uh, if it had been easy, we probably wouldn't have a panel to talk about it, right? If, we were, <laughs> uh, if this was a piece of cake to go through. Well, and I don't know if you've experienced it on on your ends, but you know we're we're dealing with trying to get teachers just to use more of those online tools, let alone make that shift in pedagogy or content or instruction. So, um, as much as we'd like to get those sages sage on the stages off the stage they're still, we're seeing they're doing, trying to do the same thing um, digitally instead of taking that step back and shifting the way that they teach. And so I think that's a challenge for a lot of districts is um, can we shift that mindset mindset while teaching to the, to, and I hate to say that we teach to tools, but unfortunately for many teachers, we had to teach, this is how you get online. This is how you Zoom, right? Like, so now we have to be creative in, this is how you get online and this is how you can structure your learning a little different, right? So um, there's almost two things that you have to work on with, with teachers, I think. Julie, I've been thinking about that a lot in training pre-service teachers, um, because mm -hmm. if you think about how you were trained to be an educator in your undergraduate experience or your graduate experience, wherever you got your teacher training, you were trained for a face-to-face -face experience. You were trained to work in a physical space with students, arrange the desks, set up your classroom environment. Well, that's not a thing right now. So <laughs> how do we <laughs> reimagine? I know that was a really scholarly way to describe that. How do we reimagine <laughs> teacher preparation when we need to prepare future teachers to walk into interviews and walk into their first classrooms ready to be creators of online experience, ready to be creators in a hybrid space where maybe they see their students part of the week and the rest of the week we're learning remotely. Um, so that's something that I've been really thinking a lot about in preparing for the fall is how can we shift our curriculum so that it's more conducive to building that flexibility that our students will need as they prepare for their first classrooms. Yeah, that's a challenge. And I think, Jessica, the, the pre-service teachers in the first couple of years you teach, you're just concerned about classroom management and wrapping your head around curriculum. And you, there's not much, uh, not much more bandwidth than that. Um, it's pretty intense. Um, I, I would say like, and it, it's part of this, the system, but like mentor teachers and examples that are online maybe as well, talk about success stories would be really great. I think that's examples are always helpful. Um, maybe even some kind of like, like help them build their network out, you know, people that you know that can collaborate. I think that's that's important. And I think we see that happening, you know, with your teacher or co colleague next door. Like you just go next door and say, hey, how are you doing this? Or do you have this kid? How are you managing that? And I think 
um, setting up spaces to do that, to lean on other people and to get their advice, I think is, is always helpful. So when thinking about that, kind of that expansion and, and either that professional development component for you know, existing teachers, a pre-service, or um, have you had any individuals that have really been resistant to the change um, that you've either worked with or colleagues that you've worked with? And I'm just curious, how do you, how do you approach that? Because it's, it's tough. I mean, none of us, you know, really want to change is a hard thing uh, in general. Um, and this is sometimes I think it's, it's not really an option just to, to not change. I think, you know, for us, we were out of school for, we were out of our clinical environments and we were out of the classroom for a long period of time, as many of you were, and it wasn't just an option to get everyone back together and do it again. So, so how do you approach that? Or how do you, you, uh, you tackle that challenge of, of a colleague or, or a peer that that's not quite ready to do it? I'm not in an admin role, so I don't have to manage the really tricky situations. <laughs> uh, like I said, there's definitely people that I work with that were resistant to any kind of technology um, for any number of reasons. Um, but a, a success story actually is a, a friend of mine who's a AP chemistry teacher. Um, and we're at a pretty high performing school. So there's a lot of pressure to do well and have a lot of pass, high pass rates and things like that. Um, and I actually interviewed her for my podcast about this, but um, she was talking and she's like, I'm the teacher who had two file cabinets full of worksheets on paper. And I would just roll in and pass out these worksheets. And it was really easy. I didn't think about it. Well, then she's stuck like having to stay up till like midnight every night, like redoing everything. Um, and so, but what was really great about her is that she had a very positive outlook. I think she kept her eyes, like we said, on the purpose. What's the point of all of this? And realizing that I don't have a choice. Um, and also beyond that, like, and I should have done this before. And this is ultimately the best for me and my students anyway. So it's kind of like so many things in life, you don't do them until you're kind of forced to do them, whether it's, you know, wash the car, or go to the grocery store or whatever, you know, the same thing applies to, to this too. And I'm not like, this never happened to me. I'm just saying it. it's a possibility. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, like, uh, and, and, but she was a really good sport about it and her lessons are really great. And now she has like this series on YouTube of like kitchen chemistry. And so she has like a series of videos that she's doing. So uh, she took small steps. Um, she started doing explainer videos with her students as projects, you know, after the AP tests were done you know, a couple of years ago. So she started to get her feet wet, but I think being open-minded about it was really helpful. And like I said, um, you know, we can look to her as like um, a model of somebody who's maybe has my mindset of like, there's no way I can do this. I've had this, my file cabinets are full. I don't have to think I could just drop in the worksheet and somebody who's been very successful at it. Um, I think that was really great. Yeah, I have a friend that's a technology coach at a nearby district and I asked her how things were going with the teachers. And this is a school that had had a one-to-one -one initiative for four or five years. They had access to the devices that they needed, had had access to PD. And she said, there are a lot of people that are feeling a lot of regret that they did not go to those PD sessions. So I think there's this, I mean, the research shows us our internal barriers to change are much stronger than external barriers. Um, like if those things are met, we can still hold ourselves back. And I think this situation, while it has created or hasn't created, while it has presented to us a lot of challenges, a lot of barriers that maybe we were able to not see in the busyness of our day to day pre-pandemic, um, it also has kind of propelled people past those internal barriers because there's no longer a choice. Um, so kind of speaking to what Michael was saying, I think there are probably a lot of teachers out there that are thinking, man, I really should have gone to that 30 minute PD after school. There were snacks there and I could have learned some things. Um, but now they're having to go there. They don't have that option. And I think sometimes that has to be taken off the table. The choice has to go away if we are going to just push ourselves into the deep end and try something new. Yeah, I, um, uh... I agree 100%. Um, you know, if you would have asked me these questions, the challenges with teachers like a year ago, I was like, how, how can we trick them into using technology? Like, we'll tell them it makes their lives easier. It can make their grading quicker. Like, and then they'll just kind of get sucked in and then we'll go and teach them all the fun, creative things and then they'll be hooked, right? 
Um, but with this, there was no choice. And, and if we had any reluctant learners, it was, hey, students, students first. What do your students need? How are you providing what your students need? How are you providing them the instruction, the connections? This is not about you. This is about your students at home. Um, and we have all socioeconomic neighborhoods in San Diego. So we're trying to connect with, you know, everybody. And so really putting that first, um, I am a little, I'm not nervous, but I am, I'm keeping a creative mind for um, the start of next school year in that um, I'm curious how many teachers just kind of slid by to June, right? And, and now like, how, how are we, re are we going to get them back again? I need help again, or are they there? So really trying to get some creative solutions for supporting teachers with differentiated supports to those that are ready to just go and need that extra push for those more creative tools. And those that might just still need a little bit of a review and uh, start from ground zero, but um, always keeping those students in mind, right? No, there, there isn't a teacher that's going to say, I don't want what's best for my students. So getting them and giving them the supports that they need and keeping them focused on whatever it is they need to do in service of their students. Yeah. And I think just like our students, our teachers are the same way. Dif people have different needs. Some people pick yeah. up pretty quickly. Some people are more flexible and more agile and others just need a lot of handholding. And so I think a one size fits all is not going to work for our students or for our, our colleagues. So keeping that in mind, I think is really important too. And I'm not sure how you identify those other than just like you happen to know them personally, but in a large district, Julie, I don't know how you guys manage that, but maybe it's more of a site level kind of uh, decision. Yeah, we'll let you know when we figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> But I do, I agree. I think it's more of a um, differentiated coaching, just like we have differentiated instruction for our students. Um, if we really want to help everyone make their way along that change curve. Well, and it's interesting too, because we're looking, I mean, we, we have 5,000 teachers in our district. So how do you train 5,000 teachers? 5,000 teachers in a differentiated approach. So we're having to be creative and we're looking at different professional development models. Like, is it is it an online learning module? Is it some face-to-face -face and some independent work time? Or is it little video snippets that we send out at the beginning of the week? So we're trying to explore all of those options as well um, because it's a challenge. It's a talent, it's a challenge to differentiate for a class of 36 students, let alone a, a district full of teachers. So um, you have to be, uh, you have to have to keep your mind open and look at all the possibilities and how really to use technology to help leverage that. Right. So, so we talked a lot about colleagues and, and our peers, but we, we all sort of touched on students a, a little bit here. So I'm curious because not all of our students, when we, we mentioned this before, are, are equally as adept to handling these challenges. So um, the students also don't really have the same options to say, no, I'll, I'll, I'll catch you guys in the fall and we'll, we'll, we'll try this again at that point. So, you know, as, as an educator, how do you identify those students, especially now when it's, it's, it's through, you know, some sort of distance learning, how do you identify those students that are, are struggling or, or falling a little bit behind? Um, and how do you approach that, especially in this time? I think that was one of the biggest challenges that we were presented with in the spring um, because everything except happened so quickly. Um, so we were in school on a Wednesday and by that Friday, we were not going to see each other again. And so that became really difficult, especially, I mean, for everyone, but at the college level, my students are from everywhere, um, all across the country. Some of them were from different countries. And so they were not in our even geographical community. And so finding ways to communicate and for them to be able to communicate need to me virtually was really difficult, especially for students who did not have reliable access to Wi-Fi or to even to a device. And I think that's something that was really put in stark relief in this season is just that the digital divide is still very real in 2020 that many of our students have access but there are a lot of students that really 
struggled to make the transition to online learning just because they did not have reliable access to technology. For some of my college students, they didn't even necessarily have reliable access to a single place to live, right? So they would go from place to place so that they could have Wi-Fi a couple days a week to do their homework and get it turned in or to email their teacher. So I really think what became the most important thing for us, for me, so I don't want to speak for other people, but for me, it became flexibility. Um, you can turn your work in whenever you want, uh, whenever you can. It does just what can I do to support you when we are learning at a distance and are your are your personal needs being met? Because that's what's most essential to me in this season. I want you to learn, but I also want you to just be okay. Um, so I just know, I don't know the answer to that. That again is a systemic problem that's going to require high level creative solutions. Um, I know in our city, our city government has been talking about how to put Wi-Fi over our whole city, just cover the city so everyone can have access within that city limits. It's going to take a long time to figure out the logistics of that. Um, but I also live in a very rural state. And so that becomes a whole different issue. How do we cover large rural areas um, to make sure we can ensure that access? Because when we're learning remotely, kids can't just shoot us an email to let us know how they're doing. So I don't have answers. I just know that is a real problem that we're going to have to look at um, as a society and as at a systems level in education if we are going to be able to move forward. Yeah, I agree, Jessica. I think, you know, the United Nations has determined that access to information is a human right, and we're denying a good portion of our population their human rights. And if, when we start looking at it as a civil rights issue and not an issue about economics or an issue about business versus government, I mean, we have government paid for roads and electricity. We need to invest in infrastructure the same way because it's more critical even than roads now because you don't have to drive anywhere, right? <laughs> yeah. At least we yeah. don't, <laughs> the delivery trucks do. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I think the communication piece is really key. And I think, again, going back to the mindset, I remember having these conversations from a few years ago, like, well, you can't friend your students on Facebook because it's just like, it's ethically questionable. It's like, well, how am I supposed to reach, reach them, right? If I don't see them face to face. And so sort of changing uh, our understanding of the relationship that we have with students and when it's okay and how to communicate and having those clear delineations, but also being flexible and, and knowing what works with them. Um, so I think that's a key piece of it too. Um, uh, communication and keeping those lines open because like you said, you know, you had two days to figure it out. Like in two days, we're not gonna be here anymore. So get all your stuff, good luck, <laughs> you know. Um, I did a little bit of training because I saw like the storm clouds brewing and I'm like, let's all get on Zoom together. Let's figure this out. Let's make sure everybody's accounts ready on Canvas, which is what we were using for, for that system. And um, we ran through it. Um, like Julie, you were saying is like training everybody right at the beginning. This is how it works, the teachers and the students. The students, and so uh, we were all clear. We ran, we ran into roadblocks while we were face to face so that it was a little bit smoother later. But um, definitely sort of anticipating what's going on rather than um, pretending things are gonna get better? So we, um, with distance learning, we started uh, and we had our principals, we had teachers, we had tried to reach out to students. Our district provided devices, um, support for uh, the Cox high-speed internet in some neighborhoods and um, even some hot spots. but it was an expectation that principals and teachers were reaching out by phone, by home visits, whatever it took. Um, to connect with those students and made sure that they understand what they had access to and what supports that they had. Um, our district also did a really nice job um, engaging the parents. Call, we have a parents as partners and we um, created some supports for parents, like what it might look like for a student to be home, you know, learning. Uh, we also had some parent Zoom courses, uh, which were kind of fun. We had like, I think, seven different languages um, in, in meetings. So we had them translated for our parents and we worked with parents on uh, things like mindfulness and how to like calm and work with your child, how to motivate them to get assignments done. 
Uh, some other ones just how to how they can use household chores and things for students to do around the house as learning experiences for parents. So I think that's something that our district really engaged with quickly when when it because it's a shift and parents are the partners now when kids are learning at home used to be the kids go off to school and they're in the teacher's hands but now it's um there's a lot of collaboration between the teacher parent and student and so really acknowledging that and using that as a as a tool to help you uh and we're going to be using that in the start of our next school year and and holding you know webinars and things for parents like I'm, I mean, I'm a teacher of 20 whatever years. I'm not going to do the exact number. And I still can't sometimes get my daughter to do her homework, right? And, and I was a teacher. Like, what are some of those tricks that I can teach parents? And mm -hmm. I think that's going to be really important as we have this kind of, it, it goes back to that flexibility. We're going to have to be flexible with face-to-face -face -face learning, at-home learning, engage parents in that work as partners and um, try to make those connections the best we can. If we can connect with the family, we're gonna have a better opportunity to connect with that child because they're, um, you know, they're in it with us. Right. I think it's fascinating, Julie, when you, when you describe the process that, that your district took, I mean, that sounds much broader than the classic description of a, an educator in a classroom, right? So now you're, you, know, you mentioned home visits and really determining what the other factors that play into the educational process of your students. It's, you know, for us on, on the healthcare side, it's kind of these social determinants of health. It's almost these social determinants of education that now um, they're gonna have a huge impact on what you do as a teacher and how you're, the scope of, of the role of an educator is is starting to expand into these other areas. It's not about just delivering a lesson, but how do you, you know, kind of look at this more holistically? Yeah, like I, I taught middle school for 20 years and middle schools, they're, they're kind of quirky kids, right? And if you didn't connect with them, if you didn't get them on your side, if, if they did, like if they knew I loved them, and I think most of them loved me. And that's that's how we learned, right? That's how I was able to teach and get them to learn. And so you're absolutely right, Warren. Like if if we get these families on our side, we're a community, we're we're building their social emotional well-being, we're building their mindfulness, we're building them up as families, then we're all really partners in this learning. And um, I, I think San Diego Unified has done a really nice job of of really looking into the social, emotional, and, and all these aspects of, of, of what makes good learning environments and how that's supportive, that, how that's a base to any lesson and success of a student. Yeah, I think it's really great uh, what you guys are doing, Julie. Um, I've been sort of frustrated and talked to some other colleagues too about how schools uh, have become sort of like the buck stops with us, like we're responsible for all of society's ills. and lack of responsibility. So whether it's no internet connection, you know, schools are responsible for childcare, they're responsible for mental health care, they're responsible for feeding kids like multiple meals per day, mm -hmm. breakfast and lunch. And even when they were mm -hmm. off, Los Angeles Unified was like still working to like give meals mm -hmm. out. And it's like, what's wrong with our society that teachers and school district budgets have to go deal with these issues that should be taken care of by other elements of society? And so that really distracts from our purpose. You know, again, we're talking about, we're holding kids accountable, we're holding teachers accountable for this learning. It's like, well, we can't because you're not holding up your end of the bargain as a society. You're not feeding the kids. We cut medical, we cut uh, mental health care. There's no like childcare uh, or, or public um, preschool, um, like in many uh, industrialized nations. And so, now we're seeing the end result of like, now we're scrambling and adding yet another thing to this mix. And you're talking about having to deal with social emotional connections and all of those things with our students, which absolutely that's like a key piece of what we do as teachers, but you know, to a certain limit. And then there's like stuff that gets more complicated. There's stuff at home that we can't, you know, deal with because we have our own families to deal with. And I think when we ask teachers and school districts to, to take on these challenges, it's unfair. I mean, it's not going to be done right. And part of it goes back to, you know, we've been doing a lot of even just, and I, now I'm thinking of all of this, like uh, culturally responsive teaching with Zaretta Hammond, and we've been doing a lot of work in our district with that. And and that kind of takes me full circle to like, we're, we're understanding the child and giving these, these experiences that 
um, that that students are engaged in, and then and and it's good for their their mental well being. But then that goes back to like changing that content area as well for teachers, like shifting that whole content of the child first. It's not the content first. And and what do these children need? And what kind of content do they need? What kind of supports can we provide them to that level? But um, it, it it it's kids first, right? Whatever it takes. I mean, we see that on the on the the medical education or on the the higher. Uh, kind of health education side as well. I mean, we, um, you know, our students are are older, and you know, many of them are independent. But there are you know a number of them that have their own families, or they take care of others, or some of them even work to provide for families that they either live with or or um, or or kind of dependent on them as well. And it's interesting because it's it's you know there are times, especially I think for us that we realize that with everything going on, um, you know, maybe there does need to be a pause on the education side just to sort of get all get everything else stabilized first and so we've we've had open discussions with our students broadly that you know for for many students you know this is a time where you know you can still go through and 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 go through the medical education kind of trajectory but for some of you it might make more sense to take you know, a few months off, um, or if you're caring for someone who is high risk of, of illness or you yourself are at high risk of, you know, picking up um, any sort of bad infection, maybe this is not the time for you to be in the hospital and, and sort of recognizing that um, it, even though there is a prescribed pathway um, for some of our older our students, you know, following that trajectory is not always the right thing. So it, you're, Julie, you're absolutely right. It is that that student first component, but it definitely does feel different. I think from again, even six months ago, of you know my role as a curricular dean, um, there's these other larger non curricular components that go into all of these decisions that I think are are good that we're addressing it mainly because maybe it isn't being addressed elsewhere, but it also highlights that it isn't being addressed elsewhere, and you know you know we. We're not going to just not do it, but also, you know, I'm not maybe the best person trained to do so, but we do what we can because we have this desire to, to be so student and learner centric. And it's interesting, too, because I'm thinking that, you know, we're talking about access to Internet and devices and stuff like that, um, but there's all these other issues. And so we know that, you know, people of color and those of the working poor are going to be even further behind now because they're the ones that are not showing up to the Zoom meetings because their parents have to go work, they're essential workers, if they're working, right? Um, and so they're left with an older sibling to kind of manage that teaching element or to care for them and to make sure they're getting their work done and it's not getting done. And so again, what's the societal role in making sure that these folks don't get even further behind than they already are? And it, again, it becomes a matter of social justice uh, and, and more than just you know, what, what we're capable of doing here in this conversation or in our roles in school districts. And so whoever's watching this, I would say, definitely please like make this legislation, like this has got to be addressed on a, a much deeper systemic level than just one of those systems, just education, because as we're seeing, everything's interrelated. And I'm sure in the medical field, you're seeing that too. You know, it's not just, oh, well, if I tell the patient, they're going to follow this, you know, process or, you know, make sure you take your medications every whatever, that's not going to happen or change your lifestyle right? So you're healthier. I mean, sometimes that's not feasible for some people. And so it's not that you're a bad doctor, you know, um, but there's something else that's deeper that's embedded in. I think that needs to be addressed before we can address any of these other technical issues. Another question that I have, I mean, this is, you know, as we kind of talk through this, this process too, right? It's, um, there are some, I think, frustrations and challenges that we internally, um, as educators can't always solve, right? Um, and so how do you um, how do you deal with some of these challenges, right? I mean, how, how do you decompress or kind of manage the uh, sort of this additional burden that the teaching now creates? I mean, it's, you know, some, some days we're, we're sitting like this all day behind a screen and in front of a camera, um, and that can, you know, be emotionally challenging as well. Um, so how do, you, how do you, for your own mental health, how do you take care of yourself in a time like this? 
Well, <laughs> I'm very, I, I don't relax at all. Um, <laughs> so, Julius, can you tell? I was going to say, you're talking I'm to like, people that don't take breaks, I feel I like. Know. <laughs> this is a tough question, Warren, because I think March, I don't know what it was the day that all the kids went home. I think I was putting in 15 hour days, seven days a week. Like I didn't stop. So, you know, it's a really good question. Um, but I did take my first day off yesterday, which I was very proud of. Uh, but I've been making sure now that I've, uh, I'm exercising. So I'm doing a really good job of trying to fit in exercise. And what I love about that is that like there's two, I'll go for runs and I'll either go for a run and listen to music and let it all go, or I'll leave my music at home. And that's where my creative juices really start flowing. So I can go on a 20, like sometimes people in my department, I'll be like, oh my gosh, I think Julie just came back from a run because there's like these emails that get thrown out everywhere with these ideas that I came <laughs> up with. And then I'm also a little high strung. So I purchased the uh, Calm app <laughs> and mm -hmm. I've been trying to do some daily mindfulness, which um, I don't do like that's not me. Um, but if we want our kids to do that, we want our teachers to do that. So I need to embrace and try it. And I will admit I'm, I'm slow going, but um, mindfulness and exercise are uh, attempting to keep me somewhat sane. Mine's actually the same. Um, I actually started using the Calm app in January. I just had had a really busy fall. And so going into the spring, I was like, I need to create some time to pause. Now I have to admit that when we were still in school, a lot of times the call map was happening like on my drive, which is not really when you clear your head completely. So that's cheating at mindfulness. But that has just building the practice of taking 10 minutes a day to try to make myself not think about anything has been really powerful for me and I think has helped me to be more clear headed when I am working. Um, so just teaching myself to have that discipline to pause has been really important. And then exercise, just trying to do something active every day. Um, so anyway, same, Julie, those those have been really important practices for me to just set that time aside and um, the other thing I've been trying to do is I check email morning, lunch, and evening instead of just keeping that tab open all day and setting those prescribed times when I go to email has helped me to be more intentional about how I'm spending my time throughout the day. Um, Cause I found if I just kept that tab open all the time, I was constantly distracted by that number because I'm not into unread emails. <laughs> um, so that that has been a practice that I've adopted in the last couple of months that's been really helpful for me. Yeah, I would totally uh, agree with what you guys were saying. I think um, one of the things that's been really great about this, another one of the many silver linings, I think, from remote learning is the pacing has slowed down a lot. Um, at least for me, I know some folks like Julie you are responsible for district level kinds of things and like hauling butt to like, create curriculum for everybody. From a classroom uh, perspective, I can say that um, I, I was okay. Um, I have like window light now because my classroom doesn't have windows. So I have daylight, which is definitely physiologically important. Um, I get up in the morning and I go for runs, um, which I used to run a little bit, but now I run almost every day. And then I come back and I have time for breakfast. You know, I feed my body. And I didn't have that before. And so coffee and breakfast and kind of let your mind sort of ease into the day. I do a little bit of inspirational reading off of Twitter, finding articles and stuff. So that sort of catapults my creative thinking. Like Julie, for you, you said it's running without the music. And so for me, it's like I'm inspired by like articles that I'm reading. And so that gets me to really think about the day. Um, and then I think, you know, getting back to this creativity uh, piece for our talk is I think what's great about Creativity is that it allows you to have a, an element of control over your life. And so when things are out of control, like they are now and constantly changing, like day to day, um, you need some kind of stability. And so for me, it's always been making stuff. So I took a graphic novel class and started making a graphic novel. Um, I learned to bake sourdough bread. I know that's Same. a cliche, right? I did that. <laughs> um, I did that. Like, I love cooking, but I never made the time for it because I was always too busy doing lesson plans and, you know, going to conferences and things like that. And um, now I'm like, okay, 
I'm going to get back into what I love to do. And doing things physically with your hands, I think, is important. And making things um, helps you have an element of control and just rekindle passions that you've you've had all along or maybe forgot about. And so I think that's important too, right? No, this is great. I, mean, I, I asked this question because it's, it's very easy, especially right in the height of this, to just be sort of engulfed by uh, all the change in the process and sort of that, that steady state level of anxiety just slowly creeps up day to day. And, you know, I, I know of colleagues that, you know, have, have been burnt out, especially over these past few months. And, you know, some people have, you know, I hear some people that talk about, you know, they haven't done much for a few months. And I know other people um, that are very busy educators that would love, you know, three hours off to sort of relax and unwind. And I, and I think that self-care component, especially now, if this is going to be, if any semblance of this is going to be the new norm, I think it's important to create that intentionality about self-care, um, whether it's exercise or mindfulness or even, you know, inspiring your own creativity through other exploits. Um, yeah, and, and just to kind of build on what we were just saying, I think another one of the many silver linings is we have time now. You know, instead of commuting 45 minutes each way from work, that's time you can use to sleep. And that's the biggest advantage my students and some of my friends have said too, is like, I get to sleep, I get enough sleep now. Um, and so let's look at all of the advantages to being remote because there's many of them. Uh, and you do have time for self-care. You do have time for that run. You do have time to learn you know, how to bake bread or something like that. Um, I think that's really a key piece. And you know, like I was saying earlier, my students, we wasted so much time in our schedules um, clocking minutes because that's what counts for your pay. That's what counts for learning, right? It's like how many minutes you've, you've done your time sitting in a chair or you know what? I'm going to give you this assignment. You have three days to do it. Do it as fast as you want. <laughs> and then the rest of the time is yours. And so then you can follow those passions. You can do those hobbies. Um, the kids aren't doing competitive sports anymore, which has been fantastic. Because now they're not, I know, Julie, your, your daughter competes competitively. So maybe that's a problem. But um, <laughs> She's been out of the gym. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But I mean, like, it's, that's how many hours a day we're using for that in, in schools in the United States um, that we could do other things with, right? Um, so again, it's a matter of priorities and how you measure success and what the purpose is of, of what you're doing. And are there other ways to, to, like Jessica was saying, reimagine the school day and how we spend our time? I think it really cuts back to that social emotional wellness piece a lot. Mm -hmm. it, and yes, I would love to yes and that one. Um, with one of the principals of uh, one of our high schools that's in a, um, a, it's in a diverse neighborhood. Um, you know, the principal has shared with us a couple of things in that um, she's noticed certain students uh, love the distance learning because they've become essential workers. And so they have to go and work for their family during the day, but now they can come home and get their schoolwork done. So this distance learning has given them the flexibility, going back to that flexibility, uh, given them the flexibility to be there for their family, yet still continue with their education. She's also spoken to some um, students where they are completely different students in the distance learning environment because they're away from the oppression from teachers and the social um, the social interactions of their peers and just being home and able to concentrate on the content and, and not be distracted by some of the some uh, the, their community their school community has actually proven to be better for their education which is really that was really interesting to me. And I think that comes back to the power of asynchronous learning, which I know we've talked about like building community through synchronous time when we're all together. But I think one of the most important things that we did moving into remote learning was say, OK, what are the most essential things that students need to know? How can we design a space where they can work through that essential content in a way that works for them, in a way that is totally flexible to the needs of the student and the family. Um, and so I think that worked for some kids. I had students that finished their whole semester in like four days because they just <laughs> needed to be done. And part of that came from this sense of like 
looming anxiety. I have no idea what the next month of my life is going to look like, but I can control these assignments that are out there and are ready for me to complete. So if I can just get this done, then I can face the uncertainty. Um, and some students needed that paced out. What do I need to do week to week? And so I know as we move into the fall, we want to build a sustainable model for what remote learning can look like. And I'm hopeful that that still involves that asynchronous flexibility because it speaks to the needs of a lot of our students. They need community and they need opportunities to see their peers and to see their teachers. But I think they also need that flexibility and that that can then create that space for them to be creative and pursue things that matter to them and engage in authentic learning and support their family communities in the way that works for them. So anyway, that was a really long answer to that. But it, I just feel like all of this is coming back to that flexible, student-focused, um, creative thinking around what school looks like. I mean, we have this really great opportunity if we're willing to um, hold on to it and see where it takes us. I love that, Jessica. I totally agree with you on that. Um, the timing, a flexible time of how much time they get to work on something. And I'm guilty of like <laughs> holding off on giving assignments out until like, you know, the bare minimum time that I need to give them out when I, some kids are hungry for it, especially during remote learning and, and the pandemic, like they needed the art projects to get through. Um, and the assignments that I gave helped them deal with it. Like, quarantine life photography and stuff like that. And it mm -hmm. helped them process it and they were hungry for it. So, um, so I think that's really important to keep that in mind too. And it's interesting, we were talking about uh, distractions and how we used to talk about, oh, technology is distracting, um, except it's like a fundamental key tool that we're using right now. And I think about, mm -hmm. like you were saying, uh, is that there's distractions in school. There's all the social like bullying and all that stuff is not really happening right now. Uh, think about how many classroom management issues have you had in the last three months? Like none, <laughs> right? How many school shootings have there been? Oh, wait, see? So maybe there's some advantages to like doing this slightly differently and in a social emotional way. I think it's given us space to have that awareness, Michael. We were all so busy and moving in these patterns that felt so normalized to us that we didn't have this, we were not giving ourselves the permission and the space to be aware. Um, and that goes back to seeking out those opportunities that we weren't seeking out before, whether that's for creative pursuits or for redesigning our curriculum or redesigning the way our classrooms look. And so I, and that really brings back that mindfulness that we were talking about. So if we create that space for self-awareness, then we can say, okay, what is it in this moment that I need, or what is it I need to be creating? What is it I need to be providing for my students or for my colleagues? Um, so I think that's really important, creating those spaces and self-awareness too around technology. To I have to stop myself and think, am I distracting myself right now with what I'm doing on this device or am I being intentional and purposeful in how I'm using this tool to create something or to help other people? Yeah, and that's something that I was thinking about earlier, which is this um, idea of owning the, the learning and having more de self-determination for our students. Like, it used to be like you would go into class and you would hope to get caught by the teacher because it's like a badge of honor, right? Oh, I'm using my, my tool. And you're like, now you get street cred because you got busted or whatever, right? Um, and so now it's like, it's up to you to manage that. Um, it's up to you to manage your schedule, which is actually something my kids struggled with a lot is managing their schedule. Um, but most likely because the teachers were inconsistent about, you know, asking too much of them and everybody had a different story. Um, but I think owning the, the learning, I think is really important. Like we were talking about the creative stuff, you have control over that. Um, and there's a purpose behind it. You're, you don't have the teacher and the, the bell telling you when it's time to change your, th your thought process which again goes back to the flexibility piece of like, I would like to sit here and do a deep dive and spend five hours just on this subject because it's really fascinating and I'm, I'm on a roll. I've got my stride now. Um, uh, and so uh, all these things are interrelated, um, but uh, I'm rambling at this point. <laughs> Stop me at any time. <laughs> I know that's how I felt too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
No, I mean, we've, we've covered a lot of, I think, really interesting ground I mean, today. You know, what started with a simple talk about a uh, simple talk about creativity really covered a lot of key issues, right? You know, from, from, you know, working backward, the, the, this power of the asynchronous learning to flexibility, uh, you know, from self-care, you know, the purpose and intent. I think all these pieces that are so kind of closely tied to what we're doing. And I think, you know, talking about silver linings, I don't think any of this, as we think about this next iteration of what, you know, curriculum or education is going to look like, it wouldn't have been possible, I think, without this, you know, this, this giant disruption that's happening right now. Could we have really come into you know, our, our leadership one day and say, hey, let's let's clear the plate for the next two weeks and just see what happens, right? That would have probably never happened if it wasn't for, you know, this giant disruption of the pandemic. And, you know, there are some downsides, but I think that this is a really big kind of inflective moment for us to think about what is what is the next few years look like or what is kind of future education look like. Um, I think as we're kind of nearing the end of our time here, maybe just the, the last question for us to, to to think about is, you know, thinking about creativity and just all these different ideas we've talked about today, you know, moving forward, do you, each of you sort of have a, a, a guiding principle or a sort of guiding direction that's going to uh, really inform your next set of decisions for how you're going to be in the classroom or how you're going to help it administer or provide professional development. But do you have any sort of guiding thoughts on, on the next steps? Patience. I think that's really wrapped around um, all of the things that I think about when I think about designing instruction. We've talked a lot about flexibility and being aware of students' needs. And I think a lot of that is tied up in this um, the idea that we have to let everyone move at, uh, we have to be patient with people, you know, no one ever did something because we were like, hurry up and get it done. You know, that all that breeds is discontent and conflict. And now I don't mean we need to wait for change in every situation, but I do think we just have to walk into this next season of what school looks like with a healthy dose of grace for the people around us. Um, and so just empathy and patience and understanding that everyone is um, trying to navigate this together and it may look different for all of us. So I guess those are some just guiding principles that I'm trying to take into my interactions with colleagues and with students is just how can I bring empathy to the table in every interaction? How can I bring grace to the table um, so that we can all collaborate and create a learning environment that is conducive for, for everyone. Well, my first, uh, first one for me is teamwork. And after our uh, conversation today, I'm gonna make sure I take Jessica's advice and find some people to join my team that aren't always on, on my team, right? Like find some critical friends moving forward. We, we learn from all experiences, right? Um, and then I think something that I'm really working on, uh, and maybe it's the calm app, I don't know, but on being a, a better listener. And uh, sometimes I come in, I come in fighting, I have the answer, I know what I want, I think I know what everybody needs. Um, it might be in my department, it might be at a school site, it might be in another situation. And I'm working on really stepping back and being a good listener and understanding other people's, and I think Jessica, you said empathy, right? Like um, understanding where other people are coming from. I have a very heavy technology background. I'm passionate about it. I think it's like super important. Other people are passionate about social emotional learning or math or whatever. So I have to keep that open mind so that I can be creative and find how we can all work together as a team. So teamwork is teamwork and being a good listener is how I'm moving forward. Yeah, I agree with those guys and building on that like humbleness, like mm. understanding that you're not the smartest person in the world or in the room <laughs> uh, and that it's okay to reach out to other people and ask for help um, to be wrong and to admit it, especially to your students. I think that'll actually earn a lot of respect. Um, flexibility like we were talking about and definitely clarity on purpose. I literally had kids uh, who didn't show up to Zoom meetings uh, or out loud asked questions like, I don't get the, what's the point of school? I don't know why we're, what we're doing. 
and, and I think we need to do a better job of understanding that for ourselves as teachers. Like, what's the purpose, really? <laughs> um, and communicating that clearly to the kids and designing lessons and projects, projects, not tests, that are going to build those skills and assess those, act, those mindsets um, and those processes. Um, but there has to be a purpose. Just like you wouldn't want to go into a professional development meeting and not know what you're doing and realize that this is all useless. It's no different than what the kids are, are doing. Like, should I show up to that Zoom meeting? Should I really do this assignment? Because they're asking the same questions. And, and ultimately, I think the, the key word for everybody is to have fun. Like, if you're not enjoying yourself, like, I don't know, I, I should be doing something else if I'm not having fun. And so I try to design those lessons that I will enjoy as well. Um, and it's definitely work. It's always going to be work but it's work that you feel is enjoyable and has the purpose and is something that's interesting to you. So figure out a way to make that happen for everybody. So there's joy in learning again. Awesome. Well, Julie and Jessica and Michael, this has been a whole lot of fun. And I can't remember the last time that I spent 90 minutes on, uh, on a meeting where I wasn't checking email or doing something else or <laughs> trying to turn off my video so I could do something else in the background. So um, this has been a, a blast for me. And it, it's good just to be able to connect and kind of talk through the process with, with educators such as yourselves who've been in these same scenarios. I think there's a certain degree of... Uh, of, of teamwork and camaraderie and even a small component of therapy involved in that and just being able to talk through our collective challenges. But this has been a, a profound experience for me and I'm glad we got to share this time together and talk about the process and, and where we go as educators moving forward. So I thank you all for your time.